So when did you guys get heads up then for ODA 595? Was it that you heard about that prior to going over? So you were building up or, or for Task Force Dagger? Or when did that combination? No. Yeah. So Task Force Dagger for for us was always about uh, personnel recovery for the bomber crews. So that's all it was. We didn't know anything about the SF initiative with the UW campaign, right? Unconventional warfare. So we were working for an Air Force colonel doing the personnel recovery. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, fifth group shows up. Like, you know, one day we get up and there's an isolation facility, a bunch of tents with barbed wire around it, you know, that wasn't there like when I went to bed. <laughs> and it's like, what the hell is that, right? And then like, oh, Al, you need to get over here and brief the new colonel. I'm like, what new colonel? It was Colonel Mulholland, a fifth group commander. And so, uh, you know, we started, I had this map that um, I called the pretty map, right? I had uh, NEMA make it, and it's now NGA, right? It used to be NEMA. And um, it's the only thing of its kind. I wish I could find that thing. I mean, I don't know where it went, but it's a, that thing made all the difference to explain. Because prior to Afghanistan, everybody was used to, what can I carry and how far can I carry it, mm -hmm. right? So we do what we call coffee can rings, like your emblem here, right? A big circle that represents on a map 250 miles, right? I can go 250 miles, loiter for 15 minutes, and come back 250 miles and carry 40 people. In Afghanistan, that's not the case because you may have a piece of elevation that's 12,000 feet and a quarter mile away, it's 3,000 feet. Big difference in what I can carry there, right? I mean, I can, in, one, in one sense, I can carry 70 people, and the other one, I can carry five, right? Which is the whole thing with the Red Wings, you know, why there was so few SEALs on the QRF aircraft to go help those guys, you know? Hmm. So, anyway, these new these people would come in. They'd say, well, I want to know how come you can't carry, you know, 50 people or whatever like you do back home. It's like, well, in Kuwait, I could do that for you. I could tell you, I could fly to Baghdad, do 50 minutes to come back and I could carry a, a Humvee and 15 guys. Right? I can't tell you that here because I don't know. And the pretty map was how I was able to show them because it was colored in DTED, um, Defense Terrain Elevation Data, I think they call it. So everything above 12,000 feet was red. Everything that was you know between that and 9,000 feet was amber and you know that kind it's of thing. a heat map that showed elevation yes yeah three-dimensional so, nope map. well it, it was sort of topographic yeah. yeah and it was it was groundbreaking for its time right this guy hand made this map for me oh right? i mean he put all these elements together it took him like two days and um we, we just roll it up and lay it out and it's you like didn't have any overlays or anything no, on top of no. this was you know a general you know general <laughs> would come in I want to know why you can't just do coffee can circles like you do in wherever. Yeah. And we'd lay the map out and go, well, sir, where it's red, I can carry five guys. Where it's green, I can carry, you know, the whole spiel. That and was they, cool. And we did that from Mulholland, right, Carl Mulholland. And he looks at me and he goes, damn, that's some information I really could have used about two weeks ago. And that's when I found out they were in the next room down in Tampa. Oh, shit. If they'd have just brought me in, you know, hey, you know, Hey, uh, 160th guy, can you come talk to us for a minute? You know, but they were keeping it a secret. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. And that's because they, uh, at that point, they actually dropped them 40, what was it, 40 kilometers or 40 miles off target or something like that, wasn't it? it no? Not that I know. Okay. Like, we never put anybody off target. And the cool thing we always did was whenever I put a ground force in, I, I store the location, right? It's just a little button store. And, you know, we also have a video uh, VHS tape back then, you know, uh, running, which has the position on it. So if I came back for the after action review and so you put us off target, you know, really? Well, let's take a look. Oh, look, it's right those, on those the coordinates you gave me. Uh, yeah, it sure looked, <laughs> it sure looked farther. You know, especially, you know, we used to do these different types of infills. You had to the X, to the Y, and an offset, right? And to the X just meant you were landing yeah. outside the building, right? Yeah. And, um, in order to do that, we had rules that we had set that um, you had to have rotary wing casts. So Apaches or, or DAPs or little birds had to go with you to the X, right, to defend you while you're yeah. down in the troops. And if you couldn't get those, you could use an F-15E um, or an AC-130, but you had to land 300 meters and out, right, so outside of, you know, effective rifle range. And um, just so happened one day I was in Iraq, 
and I was working with Delta and the guy says, all right, I want to go right here. I go to the X and he goes, no, nope, it's not the X. We don't have rotor wing casts. This, uh, this Y intersection over here. I said, oh, not the X, but the Y. And we played it up, you know, going to the Y and it actually stuck. Yeah. And now we actually call have it the Y. y right? yeah. And then the cool. offset is you put them, you know, five to 10 kilometers away and Depending on the conditions, they might even hear you, the bad guys, right? But by the time everybody gets their act together and they walk there, you can watch on the on the ISR feeds, you know, the bad guys on target. Well, they'll hear a helicopter. They'll get alert. They'll, they'll be on the parapets of the roof with their rifles out, you know, and everybody's woken up. And then as time goes by, it's sling arms, mm -hmm. and the rifles leaning up Take against the, the building. Off, the They're smoking a cigar. We start right? leaning over. Right? Yep. And then they go to sleep. And right about the time the guys get to the last There's a charge last. on the door and things yep. go. So that was that. <laughs> wow. What was, um, you know, a after Task Force Dagger and everything, or after that was all complete, um, what was, you know, outside of some of the things you just pointed, what were some of the things that you guys took away from that that y you knew then could start really helping you in the, the war going forward? Well, uh, the one thing we haven't even really talked about is the terrain following radar. I talked a little bit about it in Knoxville with a guy that didn't like that we didn't have tents. So this piece of equipment will allow the aircraft to fly in instrument meteorological conditions so you can't see out the window at 100 foot, 300 foot, or 500 foot clearance altitude. Right. So what that means is I can fly, imagine driving your car down the interstate in a serious fog, you know, fog bank, right? You can't see out the window. But your, uh, what do they call that? Now, the adaptive cruise control can still see the lines. Mm, yeah. It'll still drive it, right, until it doesn't. But back then, I mean, the aircraft wouldn't do it for you. It gave you a little cue. As a matter of fact, those coins I gave you, Yeah. if you look at the, so that's an attitude indicator, right, from an aircraft, and look to the left side, there's a little diamond. Yep. Okay, that is a TFQ. So the the power is your left hand, right? It's called a thrust control and, or a collective and a normal and a single rotor helicopter. So that diamond will trend up and down slowly, right? And that will keep you on whatever altitude you set it at. So let's say 500 feet above the ground, right? So... As long as I'm 500 feet above the ground and it looks out about 10 miles and it sees a mountain and it goes, oh, you're about 10 miles from this mountain. Based on the performance characteristics of the aircraft right now, you need to start a climb now. And that diamond will go low and turn into an inverted uh, triangle, which just represents pull power. Mm -hmm. So you pull the power until you're in a climb that will clear it and then it goes to a diamond, right? I mean, this is all you know, months of training just to learn how to do it. but. So you're playing a little video game, you know, following that cue to stay above the, the terrain, right? So we learned how to use that. So in peacetime, it was a general officer signature to allow you to do that for real. Like you could do it in the flight simulator and you could do it with night vision goggles where you could, when guy would flip his goggles up and follow the cue, but the other guy was a, a safety pilot, essentially. You know, if you were going to hit something, he'd just take, yeah, I have the controls, you know, and that would be that. But now this is for real. And the problem with this damn thing is sometimes it reboots unexpectedly. Oh, so I think I, you're, you're about to make an important phone call and your iPhone locks up, right? And you're like, damn it, it, it won't. Yeah. And you got to reset your iPhone. Well, yeah. that's what happens here, except your life, you know. And all you can do is climb as high as you can go and as fast as you can go. We used to say, climb like your life depends on it, because it does. <laughs> but we learned how to use that. Um, the horse soldiers infill, that's how I got there, was... So I didn't actually go to 25,000 feet on that mission. They got that yes. off on the story. Yes. That was a that was a following mission. It was a Kazavak where uh, my whole crew was hypoxic. And I, it was me and one crew chief were on a different oxygen system. And we did it all on ourselves. And everybody else was, like, drunk. Oh, God. Yeah. And... And so in that case there, it wasn't a 25. It was, it was like 12, 13,000. Okay. But I was carrying the whole team. So originally I was supposed to carry half of the ODA in one aircraft and half in the other. But in order to do the ODA 555, triple nickel, they needed three Chinooks to, to do it because they were going over bigger mountains. Yeah. So they had less fuel. So they had to carry 
you know, less people, less people. So I got stuck with carrying the entire team, which meant that I had to air refuel in and out, which is something we always tried not to do. Yeah. Uh, but that became the norm, you know, get air refueling when you need it. If you don't, if you can't get on the hose, you land in the middle of the desert, pull security, and someone will fly gas out to you. Good Lord. You know, which happened to me once. You know, the, the tanker was a no-show. Wow. No. Yeah. Wow. It was, we, we had Papa models out of the 8th SOS, and uh, those guys were awesome. The best tanker sport I've ever had. They got pulled away to support the 53s down in Pakistan, and they sent uh, Talon 2s instead right so talent is basically the same aircraft but it has a smaller fuel capacity and their combat talons right what that means is they like to do drops you know drop car drop uh you know supplies and stuff like that and uh they prioritize the drop over fuel and uh, oh how nice of them yeah i mean they didn't i don't think they realized we'd run out of gas but you know still Oh my God! So, um, was it as depicted within the movie that it was kind of jumpy and in the whole bed? And, oh yeah, no, it was. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was cold. So they tried to depict that in the movie. Yeah, you know, with the snow coming in the window. I mean, those guys were frozen. I mean, you could turn the heater on, but the doors are open because the miniguns are hanging out. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, they did. You know, it's funny. I talked to Jerry Bruckheimer at the at the premiere. We had a little icebreaker with the actors and the ODA and the pilots. And I said, I was having a drink with Jerry, and I was like, hey, uh, I hope you didn't make us look bad. I said, every time I see a special operations helicopter pilot get shot at, they freak out and crash. You know, like The Rock, uh, yeah. White House Down, or yeah. whatever, you know. Yeah. It's like, these guys are flying so low, they trip a traffic cam. You know, they're that good. And then the first round, they're shooting at us. Yeah. And they, they crash into each other. It's like, and he goes, well, he goes, I think you're going to like it. He goes... But keep this in mind. He says, we made a movie, not a documentary. He's like, okay. So if you, if you approach it with that aspect, right? And then, you know, they didn't show very much of the Chinooks in the movie, but uh, in the deleted scenes, there was a lot more of <laughs> I the... Love, uh, I love when you're talking about that. You mentioned that <laughs> off air. Yeah. And, and I will say this, that the, um, the 160 of Chinook that they did when they did the medevac, the dust off out of there... Yeah. That was probably the most pristine looking helicopter I've ever seen. I mean, everything that was shiny, that what could be shiny. That's because it, it was a brand new MH-47G. I mean, mm-hmm. it was just so clean. Yeah. The that first paint. Chinook I got on, there was a blow-up doll on the jump seat, and it was, <laughs> it was just disgusting. It was, it was stuff hanging everywhere, oh, and yeah. it was just... It, but you know what they did, though, is, is uh, the crew chiefs that... Um, that set that aircraft up for the movie. So that was the 160th that did it. And uh, the pilot that was flying it would call me every day. And he'd say, Al, uh, why did you do this? Or why did you do that? They want to know for the thing. And I was like, well, I didn't go to 25,000 feet on that mission. You know, we didn't have to use oxygen. We went to 12, maybe 13. And he's like, well, when did you go to 25? I was like, the two nights later. <laughs> <laughs> but that was on the Hindu Kush, not yeah. over here. So the big thing with the two, the two different flights is that you know, the one that went to the mountains that same night, um, you know, they had to encounter bad weather. Like I had a sandstorm. They had snow, ice, rain, you know, that kind of stuff. So they were more likely to die as we, you know, we sat around with our gallows humor. It's like, hey, you're going to die from running the mountain and I'm going to die, you know, a surface air missile, you know, because I've got to penetrate <laughs> the, the air defense. And that, you know, my buddy Andy was the other flight lead and we would um, go back to the bunker after a couple of nights and he had a bottle of bourbon he got from the CIA. And um, he goes, what do you think? I, go, I think we're going to die. Like, in the next mission or two, he goes, yeah, we're screwed. <laughs> and But we did this off on our own so nobody would hear us. 